We're going to spend the next 50 minutes rocking for you. we got a great guest, and that guest is also going to be our guest in ITL. Stay tuned. You're at Pensado's place. What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's Pensado's Place. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. Um, Ked, I really respect and have a lot of uh, admiration for Eric Valentine is going to be on the show today. Uh, real special show today, Herb. Cool. Herb, cool. my wingman over here. Hi. <laughs> this is the part of the show where we talk about the guest, and he's not on camera. It's exactly. kind of awkward. Well, we can talk about other things, sitting too. Sitting right next to us. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about your week. How was your week? I'm not really sure. I know how your week was. <laughs> oh, man. Swamped. <laughs> yeah, it's been crazy. Yes. But, you know, good, good crazy, good things. Good crazy. Uh, did you notice this week, we got a lot of you guys... Um, that just found the show this week and watched all the episodes or watched the majority of them and you guys really had some nice things to say about our guests and what you've learned and what you've picked up and, and so we, we, that, that, that makes this really worthwhile guys. It's, Herb spends a lot of time on the show, Drew doesn't really do much um, <laughs> and I spend a little bit of time but uh, you guys are always appreciative and, and we thank you for that. Um, I, I, there was someone I was trying to remember their name. I can't remember his name now, but uh, as usual, I have medical reasons for that. But um, great, great, <laughs> it was a great comment. I think it'll come to me. Help me out here, Herb. I'll, I'll, I'll think of this guy's name. Well, what are we great? Well, great while you're thinking about that, we'll we'll go do some stuff because because you're absolutely right. We had some great information come in through Facebook today. I had a conversation with a gentleman out of Germany about coming over there and a conversation with a cat from Canada sent some stuff who stuff was bumping actually um, so your interaction is always good and that leads us to where you can reach us which is always uh, Facebook as you know you see it up there on the screen you can always Twitter us like you do you can see us at YouTube at our uh, our YouTube channel so we always appreciate that as usual, we got our buddies on board with us, Vintage King. I think hey. Alex is in the chat room today. Alex. There's Alex up on the screen. We always like that. I um, think you win a free, um, I think you win a free Focusrite, uh, not Focusrite, but a free Fairchild $60,000 compressor if you can come up with a question that stumps Alex today. Isn't that part of the... It's still in negotiation. Oh, okay. right. that's we're, not we're, ready. we're not ready for that no, yet. No, we're not ready for that. Although <laughs> Eric was already writing his question down over there. <laughs> that that see, we'd be accused of inside baseball. Then the SEC would call. <laughs> you know, we got troubles. Um, SEC. <laughs> you talking about University of Georgia and yeah. Alabama and Auburn? Or? Well, there's a new commission that oversees these kind of web shows, so you're not worried. Yeah. Oh, you meant you meant FCC? Uh, SEC. Really? Yes. Yeah, Securities security and Exchange Commission. Yeah, it's insider information. Let's let's move forward. <laughs> so we're we're gonna get to some. When I screw up, when I screw up, we stay. When he screws up, we move forward. Keep moving. We've got a. We, of course, we got a giveaway for you at the end of the show. So uh, yeah. stay tuned. We'll give you the, some avid stuff giveaway. And one of the things that came up in comments uh, is that we want to remind people is that you can catch the show live, twelve twelve fifteen ish on Justin TV. So those of you guys who see this on YouTube or another, some of the other platforms, if you wanna get in and talk to us live and be on the chat room, um, that's where it is. Justin TV, 1215 Pacific Time on Thursdays. That's when we're taping the show. That's what time it is right about now, more like around 1219. As always, uh, our chat room and corner office, we have not the DJ, our chat jockey, the CJ, Drew Adams. Drew, yeah, you there? Drew. What's going on, people? Ah, Drew is, Drew each week has a new way to acknowledge the camera. I think it was this last week. I practice in the mirror a lot. So, uh, <laughs> a whole lot. Uh, we attended something yesterday, a very seminal moment in Drew's life. It was yeah, very cool. Very cool. Very, cool very special moment to have yeah. Drew and his family around. Yeah. Um, so back to you. We've got a great ITL, right? Yeah. I remember what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, I can't remember your name, but a, a cat in Australia sent me a really great letter. He's been engineering for about um, a number of years, and he was trying to figure out how to go from turning a passion and a hobby into a profession, which is kind of the way almost all of us get into this. And uh, I've gotten that question now in the last three or four weeks several times about, you know, how do I go from having all this equipment that I love, how do I turn that into my profession? And I, I'm not going to answer it completely now. We'll, we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time, but uh, I, I, I just want to kind of give you a heads up that 
that man just keep doing it keep doing it as much as you can the more you do it the better you get and uh, uh, you'll find that pretty soon you have a value that 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 right now you're probably getting paid what you're worth which is nothing and then as you get skills and get a re little bit of a reputation that that people will start paying you commensurate with what your, your your skill level is and then then you can apply all the you know social media marketing things and all that but right now you guys are just starting out just do it do it as much as you can don't sleep don't eat don't go to school just just engineer all the time and and you you'll, you'll get good but we'll, we'll follow up on that I just want you to know that that's on my mind I'm trying to s consolidate my thoughts on that we'll, we'll talk to you about that Herb Let's uh, introduce ITL. ITL. This is this is this is probably the most unique ITL we've done out of the thirty or forty thousand shows we've done. Um, Will went over to uh, Eric Valentine's studio, which is uh, legendary, and uh, talked with Eric about different techniques, uh, different equipment that Eric uses. And Eric was incredibly, incredibly generous with us. I want you to be sure and reach out to him and thank him for that. He, 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 he really, really opened up to us. And uh, so watch this ITL, and then next week uh, we're going to have another ITL with Eric in which he explains in a little more detail some of the things that you're, you're going to hear today on the show and see on ITL. So, Will, you ready to run it? Yep. Let's do this. Hello, Pensado's Place. My name's Eric Valentine. Welcome to my little recording studio lair. This is a barefoot recording. Uh, I moved in here in 2000. I've been here for about uh, almost 11 years now. And uh, it's been a great spot. Um, mostly left it the same as it was. It was a, a great studio um, that was built back in the 60s uh, called Crystal Studios. And um, the sound room is very similar to what it was back then. Um, I've, I've added a couple little things. I'm going to kind of walk around a little bit and show you guys uh, some of the stuff um, I've talked about here and there on some forums and uh, a couple of magazines and stuff and uh, so people can actually see them and see how they work and stuff. Um, so first, let's check out this robot. People always ask me about the microphone robot. Um, I built this thing about three or four years ago um, after just uh, endless complaints from assi assistants being tortured out in the sound room in front of five million decibel uh, guitar amps. Um, I finally put this thing together so I could put them out of their misery and uh, make it a lot easier for myself to uh, position microphones. So I'm able to sit in, uh, in the control room um, with controls that are mounted into the console itself and uh, move around the, uh, the microphone and be able to see the position. We have a little video camera on there. You can see on the monitor screen up there um, what I see in the control room. And um, so I can sit in there and just nudge it around tiny little bits at a time, um, all three directions. So it'll go left, right, up and down, in and out um, from, the, uh, from the guitar cab. And um, I'll never record guitar without it ever again. Uh, at this point, I mean, I, I mostly try to just um, EQ the guitar with the mic position. Instead of having to re reach for an EQ, I can just play with the position and make it brighter or warmer or whatever. Um, just by the position of the mic and not have to be, you know, wrenching on EQs to, uh, to get, get the guitar sound. So it gets me a lot closer when I can uh, tweak it sitting in front of my little NS10s. So then the other thing that um, I put in here was uh, what we call the drumbrella. Um, I built this, th this thing maybe two, two or three years ago. And uh, I got to give credit where it's due. Uh, this is a, just a straight up ripoff <laughs> of the one that they have at Oceanway Studio B. Uh, a friend of mine was recording over there and uh, was actually using it. And when I came by to visit him and say hi, he said, you got to come out and check this thing out. I sat down at the drum kit, played a little bit while he moved it up and down. And I, I knew instantly within five seconds, I have to have this. It is the coolest thing ever. And so basically what it does is it makes it so you can adjust the resonance of the room to accommodate the tuning of the drums. I really like to tune the drums to the key of the song that's being played. And so I can tweak the snare drum so the overtones are sort of ringing in key with the song. And I used to have this issue where, um, you know, I would get it where the snare drum was in key, but it sounded kind of thin just because it wasn't reacting with the room right. 
And with this thing, once I have it in key with the song, I can adjust the height of this so it interacts with the drum and makes it sound really full. And so, you know, I'll sit down once I have the tuning of the drum. find the spot where the drum sounds sounds really fat and uh, it works great it, we use it all the time so drumbrella then uh, you know this place has just got tons of stuff lots of instruments mics and amps and stuff for, for bands to play with when they come in here it's just it's a really cool part of um, the process for bands when they come here to be able to just dig around out here and discover an instrument or a guitar pedal or an amp or something that you know sparks an idea or inspires something for them to you know have something new to try on a song or take things in a new direction so you know this is just a big like you know it's like a big thrift shop for for recording gear people just you know rummage around out here here's your there's your marxophone that was used on the all-american rejects record it was on uh, the, the song on there that that was a duet. We've got an auto harp. This thing was used on uh, Third Eye Blinds. How's it gonna be? A long time ago. Uh, set of vibes right here. You gotta love the vibes. Um, pedal steel normally doesn't doesn't get used on rock records, but. Uh, that thing was used uh, a ton on uh, a record I did a long time ago, a band I used to play in, this band called T-Ride. And uh, we used that uh, pedal steel all over that record. Um, so yeah, tons of drums. Here's uh, uh, my red Vista Light kick drum. Uh, let's see, there's one particular snare drum that's been kicking around for a long time. So this is my bell brass snare. This gets used a ton. Um, this was all over the Queens of the Stone Age record. It was, um, man, it's, a, it's on everything. It's just a great, great sounding drum. This is a kind of a crappy old um, Pearl uh, export drum uh, that I bought. It just came with uh, a drum kit that I bought because it had a super huge kick drum that I wanted. And it had a drum head on it that sounded great, and I left it like that for a long time. And uh, this drum was on a lot of songs, and, and the drum head lasted a long time. It was on, uh, this was the snare drum on Semi Charm Life, and uh, it was also the snare drum on Queens of the Stone Age um, Go With The Flow. Um, ultimately, Dave Grohl killed that head <laughs> in those sessions, and that was the end of its run. It's never really sounded quite the same since then. Um, lots of percussion. We can look at a bunch of mics over here too. C37As, um, an old CMV3. This was used as sort of like the center drum kit mic on the Queens of the Stone Age stuff. 441s, it's a cool guitar mic, cool vocal mic. Um, there's my SM7s, I use those all the time on vocals. Um, at one point, I got really into D20s, and so I just started buying them anytime they popped up. So I have a whole, whole collection of these things. They all sound different. They're all numbered, so I can keep track of which ones I'm using, which ones I like better than others, which ones match better. Uh, so I keep track of all of that. Um, this thing, this is uh, an AKG D202, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but this microphone ended up inspiring the solution that we came up with for getting rid of the, the reflections off of the console. That's, that windscreen is made out of this weird porous metal, and when we were trying to figure out how the hell we were going to get the surface of the console to not be reflective, um, I had this microphone set up, and I think it was Larry that's, that noticed it and was like, this, this could probably work. And uh, so that actually became the solution for that. A short body uh, 47 tube mic. Uh, bought this mic probably back in 1990 for 1200 bucks. Um, it was in the era when uh, 
the band I was in, T-Ride, had got signed to a record deal and we convinced the label to let us use the budget to buy equipment and we bought that microphone um, instead of spending the money in somebody else's studio. Um, this thing, that's um, an RCA KU3A, or some people, it's also called a 10,001. Great sound, amazing sounding ribbon mic. Um, really cool on all kinds of instruments. Instantly vintage sounding. These uh, um, C12As, been around for a long time. I found these in a, in a pawn shop in San Francisco, Eagle Pawn in San Francisco, and built connectors for them and had Bill Bradley build me a power supply. They sound great. Been using them ever since for, you know, 20 years. RCA 44. Um, there's my Coles. Love these. Use them on everything. Um, lots of what I call Bobo mics. Um, just weird lo-fi stuff. That's an old Veracoustic. Um, the uh, wonderfully satanic EV666. Um, this is a this is a more recent one, the 655. This is a really cool sounding mic. Um, this is a great drum mic. Um, the D22. Um, yeah, it just goes on and on. There's all kinds of just stupid stupid stuff that sounds weird. Put on things. So. Uh, the, you know, the, the way I usually set stuff up is um, I like to keep the mic pre's out in the sound room, close to the, to the instruments. I like running nice short mic cable runs, go into the mic pre's, and then have the long run be line level from the mic pre into the control room. Um, so I, I keep a bunch of mic pre's out here. There's a bunch of, you know, reissue sort of Neve 1081 type things and some Langevins. Um, there's, uh, there's a bunch of custom tube mic pre's down there. So, so I usually have the mic pre set up here. They go through tie lines. Um, musicians listen on a, an Aviom headphone system so they can just balance their own stuff and I don't have to worry about doing headphone levels. Um, right now there's actually, this is the prototype version of the undertone audio mic pre right there. Um, I've been using that thing on pretty much everything so I can just figure out, um, finalize any sort of component changes and tweak it and make sure it's really sounding the way we want. Um, so I've been recording it on everything, trying different transformers, trying all kinds of different stuff. So once we uh, get in here, the, the mic pre's come in through tie lines and then they just show up on uh, inputs on the console. Um, so then I have a phase, phase reverse control on the channel strip of the console. I can adjust phase and stuff in here while I'm listening. And then I also have a line trim on the, the inputs of the console channel strip so I can add or take away, you know, 10 dB of gain on, uh, on the signal coming from the mic pre. So I can sort of fine tune the, the levels of those. Um, I can do any EQing and stuff that I, that I want to do before things go to tape or to the computer. And uh, so then, you know, what I'm playing around with right now is uh, a recording that's trying to recreate like an old Motown sound. And uh, so um, I'm recording each instrument sort of one at a time, overdubbing everything. And so everything goes through this old uh, Studer J37. It's an old uh, 60s all tube um, one inch four track. And um, I just, I set it up at seven and a half ips, really, really slow tape speed, very crunchy sounding. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really cool sound. Uh, so then uh, in this case, so I go tape machine first, and then go into the computer, capture the sound of the uh, tape machine into the computer. And um, then I can just monitor things back over here on the console and uh, do all my final EQ uh, adjustments and stuff on, on playback. Guys, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> that was pretty incredible. Listen, uh, some of you guys might say, well, why did they show me that? I, all I need is an MPC and a, and a Pro Tools rig because there's more to our profession than, 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 than just, you know, working in your bedroom. I want you to see that, that there's other ways to do things. You, you, you don't need to, you know, spend 20 years collecting equipment like Eric did. Uh, but there, there are options available to you. And, and, and because you guys have such an avid interest in, 
in our profession, it's good to see how everybody does everything, and, and I, uh, Eric's as good as it gets at incredible, uh, incredible studio. Guys, we're going to try something a little different. Will, um, I'm not going to ask too many specific questions about specific songs today, so uh, when we get ready to ask questions to Eric, try and tailor your questions about a, a specific element of a specific song, so we're going to try something a little different. We're going we're to let you control the interview a little bit more today. But instead of asking broad, general questions, let me do that. Um, pick a song, pick a part of a song that you want to ask Eric a question about, and we'll try to get in three or four of those. Eric, my friend, welcome, man. This is great. Yeah, thanks pleasure. for having me. Such cool, a big man. fan. Pleasure, 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 pleasure. I, I mean, like, uh, ask everybody that knows me, Will and, and Drew, uh, Give You Hell, I mean, I, I, that's just the perfect rock anthem, you know, just what a great song, just the lyrics, what you've done, he did that, uh, No One Knows, Queens of the Stone Age, I, I, the, the, I know it's sacrilegious to say, and I want to get, I will probably get our first bad comments ever heard when I say this, but uh, ACDC, Back in Black, was my favorite rock thing, and I think, uh, that's a cool thing. I think uh, No that. One Knows is now my favorite rock song. That's cool. <laughs> every time I work on a rock that song, that is dangerous. You know, every time I work on, I know there's a question here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping. Every time I work on a song, a rock song in particular, I pull up. No one knows, and I just quit. I just, you guys, when you get that call, is, is Home Depot hiring this week? I can't get this thing. But man, just a, a quick question about that song. What if, what effects, if any, are on the vocal on that? I mean, it's just. Is it how you recorded it? Is it the mic? What makes that vocal just, it's not loud, but it just, it just, is it a combination of EQ? It just cuts through the mix. It's like right in my face and it feels like he's dry. Yeah, well, um, finally a question. <laughs> Sorry, Eric. Um, there was something a little bit unique about how all the vocals were tracked on that record. We, we used two microphones all the time while he was singing. We had sort of like a hi-fi mic and a lo-fi mic. And so there's a C12 setup and there was a little um, Altec 633A salt shaker mic, this really junky old dynamic microphone that's, that's very lo-fi. And so, um, you know, so ultimately in the mix you can play, play with the combination of those oh, two mics yeah. to sort of either make it more mid-rangey and cut through more and sort of a little s smaller so it's not like taking up so much of the sonic space. Um, or if you need it to be more hi-fi, you can just do it by blending instead of sort of trying to wrench it with an EQ. Oh, that's cool. Um, was there an effect? It sounded dry. Um, you know, I, I actually I don't know exactly what was done on the mix. I actually don't, I, I didn't mix that record, okay. so that it was um, the record was mixed um, very very well by uh, by Adam Casper. Oh wow! Um, you know, okay. yeah yeah, he did a great job on the record. This would be a good time to let everybody know. Um, um, a lot of the things we're talking about today, Eric has gone on uh, Gear Sluts and shared a lot of stuff. He's got some cool pictures of. Uh, of his uh, some of his techniques, so uh, say hello to my friend Jules when you go there. Tell him we sent you, and uh, go check out Eric's Q and A on Gear Sluts because there's a lot of great information uh, on there. Also, um, you just finished the Slash album, uh, 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 incredible. And um, how, uh, tell me your miking technique for that record. Um, like for the guitar, for the for the drums, for the drums. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, that one, um, I was trying to push things back towards some more minimalistic miking. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to have um, uh, Josh Freeze playing drums for the majority of the record, mm -hmm. and he's a very accommodating drummer. He's just, he's an, an amazing player. He's pretty much comfortable playing any drum kit, set up any way I want. I can put microphones anywhere, and he'll figure out how to navigate around them without mashing my microphones. and. So it, it makes it possible for me to get drum sounds with maybe four or five microphones instead of like 12 or 16 microphones, you know, um, which is easy to, um, to rely on, you know, it, it's easy to get in the habit of doing that. Um, mm -hmm. But you think of the drums as, as the drum, you think of it as one instrument rather yeah. than a collection of 30 instruments. Yeah, I, it, it always sounds, it always sounds better and sounds like a better representation of the drum kit when you can pull it off with fewer mics. Like on, on that, that record, so probably the best example is the song By the Sword. And 
that is just a straight up classic over under style miking technique you know where there's um a mic that sort of hovers over the the hi hat and the rack tom and the snare drum mm -hmm. there's a mic that sort of hovers over the the floor tom and looks across the drum kit and it also picks up sort of the attack of the kick drum um and then i had so those were c12a's i had a uh a 67 out in front of the kick drum just a couple feet away um, and then so that's really the sort of foundation of the sound and then the other thing that I was doing on the drums on that record I wanted to create sort of um, a crunchier kind of unique ambience for the drums and so I had one 57 right in the middle of the the drum kit that was split and went to two Ampeg Jet guitar amps and, um, and I put those in the chamber at my studio. And so the whole time while he's playing, um, the sound is sort of being amplified in this reverb chamber. And so you get all this sort of distorted spring reverb that I would sort of blend in just a little bit. And there's... Oh, the guitar, you use the spring reverb from the guitar amp? Yeah. And, and, so. and was there any amount of delay in, 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 in the process that kind of made things widen or it stayed pretty solid? Yeah, I mean, it was, it's mostly, the mics on the amps are really close, so, oh. you know, um, so and the sound gets there immediately from yeah. the microphone, so, so th there isn't, isn't really any delay, it just, it just creates sort of a weird, you know, a peculiar mid-range and ambience for the drums that helps it sort of stand out against some of the other stuff. So far, I'm kind of picking up a trend um, that you, you, you like a distortion for the harmonic content of it that you seem to add a lot of that back into a lot of things you do um, is, that a, is that a fair statement I, I do I, I think I think sometimes distortion it's better is, than EQ yeah it's essential to, to make music um, feel sort of exciting and sonically pleasing I always felt like when you say the word distortion you think elephant man or something you know, or, <laughs> but, but really Technically, uh, I've mentioned this before, d d distortion is actually a rich collection of harmonics. You can think of it as an infinite number of sine waves being added to create a square wave, which is essentially a distortion mm -hmm. wave. Mm -hmm. But um, have you ever played with um, um, Decapitator, the Sound Toys plugin? I, I, I have, yeah. When I, when, when I hear your stuff, I think, I think God, that plugin was made for you because <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah. it has a lot of your sounds in it already. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a great emulation of, um, you know, the devices that I've used, the, the actual hardware devices that I've used over the years to do it. I mean, by far my favorite device for introducing harmonic coloration is, is tape machines. Um, that's the one that's always yeah. been just the most musical. and That's something you can't get away from. You, yeah. You, you talk about, I, you, you kind of, because you started out in that world, you're kind of married to that sound. I, I, I am. It's, it's actually been a problem for me at times, you know, being able to sort of like let go of that because, the, you know, obviously the, the workflow is so much undeniably better just mm -hmm. working in a computer, but it's yeah. so disorienting for me to just to not have the cushion of that sound with oh, the man, tape don't machine. change anything because what you're doing is working for me. One of the things I noticed that was kind of interesting was, was you don't really mind if you hit tape first and then dump to Pro Tools or hit Pro Tools first and then dump to tape. What's the difference? Uh, I, I think there is a difference there. Um, and, and I'll do it either way more based on um, what the workflow calls for in the session. My, my preference is to go Pro Tools first. Oh, really? Um, tape second. And I would have never thought that. Yeah, because um, the workflow is better that way. You can capture all the performances, comp things, edit them down. You're not burning tons and tons of tape all the time. You're not running the machine yeah, all the time. Yeah. And then once I have everything, you know, distilled down to all of the perfectly edited and comped and, you know, dialed in stuff, I just dump that onto a tape machine and mix it. Um, and I think there's a sonic benefit to that as well. Um, I did talk about this on, a, on uh, uh, the Gear Slots Q&A a little bit, mm -hmm. but um, basically if you go computer then tape, the harmonic over overtones that are being generated by the tape machine don't get lopped off by the really severe um, low-pass filter that's necessary to eliminate the sort of aliasing in, in digital recording. Um, and so, you know, like if you imagine you have a 10K frequency happening as part of a sim cymbal sound or something, and, you know, the tape machine is adding, you know, a, a third-order harmonic to that, then you get a 30K overtone. And even though we don't hear the actual 30K sound, people argue that it influences the lower frequencies in a way that we do perceive. Oh, yeah. And um, when you 
take that tape machine signal and put it in a computer, and let's say you record it at 48K, everything above 24K is gone. Mm -hmm. And not is it just gone, it's been replaced by this hideous square wave digital distortion that's trying to be filtered off, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think there is a difference there. And, you know, when you put it on the tape machine second, the harmonic overtones are added and they're preserved. Mm -hmm. and so it, Your choice for, for, for the digital world is Pro Tools? You're using Pro Tools? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I actually used Logic up until the mid-90s, and uh, I, I made a switch to Pro Tools when they added the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the drum editing software. Oh, uh, I'm having beat detector. Beat detector. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so having seven, a, seven or eight, a, somewhere in there. Yeah, I had a brain glitch there. Well, you're, you're in the right format for it. <laughs> <laughs> Although we all have medical reasons, so. <laughs> I don't know I, what my I excuse keep is. Saying, <laughs> as I keep saying. Um, and that's fascinating stuff. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, UTA. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, you know, the UTA thing ultimately happened um, after I'd gotten really close to the end of the, the process of building some custom consoles for myself. Undertone um, audio, by the way, guys. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I started that process because um, I was just really struggling figuring out, a, you know, um, an appropriate solution for having a console that was really doing what I wanted and was really designed to sort of emphasize addressing the issues that were important to me, you know. Mm -hmm. The, the old vintage consoles were all falling apart. I've, I've owned a, a Neve 8038, and they sound gorgeous, mm. but I just I was tired of cleaning switches and having you my sold one. That was that's like heresy. I mean, how did you keep your engineering card? <laughs> I know, <laughs> I, and I replaced it with an 8128, which could be the worst gear crime ever in the history. I know. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna have to report him to the agency, uh, her. <laughs> SEC, we talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah. SEC. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 I sold that thing, and, and um, um, it was for a couple of reasons. I mean, I, it, I had a 32-channel uh, 8038. It, it, it had 32 1081s, and it was definitely the best tracking console I've ever used in my life. But I love a top knob on a 1081. Yeah, they're, they're great. Um, but I, I couldn't, you know, it just didn't have enough channels. It had knee cam automation, which barely worked. One and or two. Nikam 2, oh, and um, and I just couldn't really move forward as a mixer on that console, and I was realizing that that was becoming a really important part of the process for me. And so, Let me stop you real quick, guys. Th there's something important here, and it's, it's very subtle, and I want you to pick up on this. That's why I'm going to interrupt Eric. Eric's describing. Uh, moving from equipment to equipment, some of it better, moving to some of it worse, but, but what he's trying to get and emphasize is, is the vibe, the flow, the feel, like when you've got people in a room and you're creating music, uh, it's more important sometimes to, to preserve the moment, to, to, to get the flow right, to, 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 and, and, and sometimes with engineers, as you do this more and more often, equipment has a feel, like I hate using equipment, little tiny knobs, I like big knobs. There's a joke there, Drew. I'm glad you weren't listening, but but uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because I think that is I think a lot of new engineers coming along don't understand how important the interface with the equipment is, not sonically, but just feel-wise, and 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 helping you get your ideas because in 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 the world you're in, ideas come and go in fleeting moments, and 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 so you get it you get something that sounds. 10% better, but you lose the best take, it's, it's pointless. Uh, is, is that an accurate thing to, to pass on to the audience? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've always felt like the tools are not as important as how they're used. And Oh, wow. And, you know, um, the vintage Neve console, you know, the 8038, it, it had some qualities that were really great, but um, ultimately there were, there were techniques and mixing that I, I felt I really wanted to start to try and use that I couldn't do in that console. I would rather have a console that has slightly less sonic integrity uh, at that point um, that will allow me to use the techniques that I want to use. And, and so I can get the creative results that I want. It doesn't matter to me if one channel on a console is the best sounding channel in the world because I can't mix a damn record with one freaking channel. You know? <laughs> and um, I need... 50 channels to really mix a modern record, at least, mm -hmm. you know. 
And so um, I'm not getting anywhere if I don't have an, enough of, of um, the tools I use to actually do creatively what I want to do. So. That's cool. And, and on your console, um, I was pretty impressed because I don't think a lot of people realize that when you put a big boat anchor like a console in a room, it affects what everything it affects the sound of the room, mm -hmm. not just the air conditioner settings, but uh, 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 a lot of people don't realize, but you can't set an air conditioner with a console in a room because the heat from the console just makes everything crazy. But, but how did you solve, you, 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 you spent a lot of time, effort, and, and, and resources trying to solve the reflections coming off the console, giving you, what, extra 2K or something? It made the monitor sound uh, completely different than what was actually being heard by the... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to get, because you, you're, you're patenting, you're patent, say it for me here, Pat, patent? Patenting. Patenting. Mm -hmm. You're patenting the, uh, the, the technology. Don't tell me about that yet, but, but the process of, of trying to solve that, that's sure, never been yeah. attempted before, has it? Um, I, I, as far as I know, this is the first time it's ever, it's ever been tried, and I feel like we've actually succeeded at, at it on the console. It, it was something that I've, I've wrestled with for a long yeah, time, a long time. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I got used to using Anis 10s. That's, that's what I use. I'm stuck with them at this point. And, you know, I did realize at a certain point, it really started to get into the era when there were, like, editing stations for computers where I'd set up some Anis 10s where there wasn't a console. I'd go, man. NS10 sound amazing set up like this. And then I realized it's the st stupid console that's creating this, you know, chaos in the mid-range. Mid it made it so difficult to really be able to, like, zero in on the mid-range of the guitars and stuff like that. Especially so you made all your knobs out of fiberglass foam? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, what's happening is there's a delayed reflection that comes off of the solid metal surface of the console, and that causes comb filtering. And the way the distances and the timing works out, it's all in between, like, about 1K and 5K. You know, mm -hmm. it's the worst place yeah. to have the frequency response go Especially like that. Especially when you love NS10s. Yeah. <laughs> And so um, when we started the console project, I, you know, I talked to the, the designer, Larry, um, and told him, like, I I'm not building a console if we don't solve this, because I'm can never i never well. going back to that. And so we kept sort of, like, working on the circuitry, and it was in the back of our minds the whole time, you know, and, and um, you know, there was a certain point, like, well, maybe I'm just going to make an outboard EQ, you know, because <laughs> if mm. this doesn't get solved, I'm not doing it, you know. And then he, I think, f finally noticed this one AKG mic, and I pointed out in, that, uh, in the ITL segment, um, that has this porous metal that it used as a windscreen. And, and he realized, like, this could work as the work surface for the console. Wow. If it's transparent enough for you to be able to sing through, that means there's enough sound getting through this metal that it, should, it can't be reflecting very much. And so I found a company that works with this type of metal and got some panels of it and did some acoustic testing. It was amazing. It, it worked brilliantly. Like we, we set up a speaker and an area of the material, put down a solid surface with a, you know, a test mic pointed at an, SN, um, at an NS10, and the frequency response looked like that. You take away the solid surface and have just the porous metal, and it literally would just go like that. It That's was incredible. astonishing. You got, a, you got a steeper angle, too, don't you? A little steeper um, angle? I mean, I, I set up the angle on the console so it's exactly perfect for me. Oh, are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, it's customized. Yeah, you Absolutely. know, like, why not? Absolutely, you're doing it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so everything... Man, all, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I've sometimes said, and not, not accurately so, but actually said it incorrectly, but sometimes engineering is just problem solving. And when I hear somebody like Eric talk about that, it just... It just re reaffirms me that a big part of what we do is solve problems. And mm -hmm. if you're not a problem solver or have a natural tendency to want to solve problems. What's interesting is that the science goes so far past just what you have to do with a record. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah music is, is really physics. Absolutely, you know? it, completely. so much of that in there. And I, and I think that's an important point for our audience to to pay attention to. You know, we're in this, in this environment now where everybody is a bit of an engineer and they're a bit of producers and they're a bit of mixers and they're... So if you don't have the physics and sort of science part of it, at least pay attention to it, you can only improve up to a point. Is that, that correct? Uh, I think there is an advantage there. And for me, like, you know, the sort of more 
scientific kind of approach to things has been helpful for me for being able to achieve a certain kind of uh, a certain consistency mm -hmm. you know because you can really sort of analyze how something gave you a particular result and then be able to sort of figure out how to reproduce those results later mm -hmm. ultimately um, I think it's more important to, you know, to be able to feel exactly. what it sounds like. Exactly. And all the calculators in the world can't figure that out. And so at the end of the day, at, or at the end of the mix, that's all that matters to me, is I can turn up my speakers and go, ah, oh, this feels exactly. great. You and, know? and consistently in our guests, that gut feeling, utilizing your instinct, making sure you're, you're responsive to that feel, yeah. has overridden. That to me is essential. Gotcha. The, the the technical part it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I have a quick question. Can we um, start to add in some of our guys from the corner office? Yeah, I got one more question. Of course, yes. Yeah, so uh, so I, Drew, I, you get ready. We're coming uh, to you. I'm in a interested second. on your take on this. Um, uh, why is pop the word pop such a dirty word? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't pop know. Pop is another name for I just sold twenty million records, but yet. Everybody pretends like they don't want to be pop. Like they think if they take a rock song and turn the guitars up, they're not pop anymore. Mm. Flash, mm. you're pop. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's a lot of. I think there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, um, I think some of the, the the stigma associated with popular popular music is justified. I oh, mean, absolutely. You know, there's some. Um, um, popular music is is a profit driven art form. And and uh, and so some of the decisions are made, you know, based on, m based more on how many records will sell than what is really sort of artistically most interesting or exciting mm -hmm. or pushes the art from forward. So I, I, I get that part of it, um, but I, you know, I like to try and and be as positive about it as possible. You know, I. I consider pop music sort of like a haiku, you know, it's like you can only use a certain number of words and lines and you have to figure out a way to do something new with it, you know, mm -hmm. there are there are very strict parameters that you have to work within when you're doing, when you're working, you know, within popular music. Um, and, and I actually feel like that's more challenging than somebody that can sit in their bedroom and they're just satisfying themselves doing the weirdest shit in the universe mm -hmm. like that's great but it's very easy because you're, yeah. you're just satisfying we all yourself. celebrate that but then when we when we attempt it on on our clients they go no 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 don't do that don't do that <laughs> <laughs> but when they listen to it on somebody else's record that sold four copies they want to be that but right, when you right. try to do it for them they're like no don't do that don't yeah do i mean I, the, the hard part is like is really coming up with something that is new and innovative mm -hmm. and interesting that pushes the art form forward mm -hmm. that everybody can get that will fit in this format where the song's got to be three minutes and 15 yeah. seconds or whatever it is you know like herb in on this. that's hard i'm gonna bring herb in on this it seems like the future could possibly be where we don't try to make records for everyone anymore, but because of the internet and the sheer numbers of people, maybe now we can start making little niche rec say that word niche niche niche, niche records mm -hmm. for uh, instead of trying to make a record that that everybody in America wants, we can make a record for the guys that just like a particular type of record in the future. Is that you think? Because you're Nostradamus, I know. <laughs> Please, uh, it, it, my opinion is that we're there. There now. I think that the internet is about niches and niches, or whichever you want to say it, and people I, I now. Niche. Okay, well, good. Okay. We'll use niche for okay. today, niche okay. for next week. Okay. Um, but people are servicing their own interests now, and the internet allows you to do that. The question always that exists is can that turn into a model, model of monetization where people can make a living do it? You certainly can access people, do your own thing, get some response, and that part is there, and it has both built an industry and it has imploded certain things. I would say MySpace ran into its problems because it just was so broad and the interface was so bad and it was all kinds of music and there's a real relative value to where that music Didn't is good or Justin bad. Justin Timberlake just bought a piece of MySpace? They sold MySpace. Justin Timberlake is an investor in it. They're going to try to repurpose it and turn it into sort of a digital web network or something. That's what I'm hearing. But, uh, but anyways, I know we're cutting into corner office. So Drew, tee up your two best questions yeah. real quick. <laughs> two? Yep, two. All righty. Eric, how do you balance the use of the drum be drum umbrella over the drums as a whole? Let's say you're adjusting it for the snare, wouldn't that affect your kick tone as well? Yeah, that's a good good question, and and probably uh, the biggest reason that I don't use it all the time. Um, 
you know, if, if uh, I, I am mostly adjusting it for just the snare drum, and there have been a couple times where it has, um, you know, caused unfavorable effects like on the floor tom or the kick drum, you know, creating sort of a low mid resonance that is not really flattering for the kick or the tom, uh, floor tom. And so, um, so well, that does anyway. Just don't uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that has been tricky, but you know, um, I'm getting more and more used to it, and it seems to really be um, the most effective when it's really a minimalistic thing. I've been really into these one mic drum sounds lately, and the drumbrella has been a huge, huge part of that. Didn't um, didn't John Bonham only use like two mics on his drums, one on the kick and one overhead? I, you know, I've heard, I, I've heard a lot of mythology about his. I, I I would find that kind of hard to believe for some of the stuff that I've heard. Yeah, some of but, the stuff. But um, uh, it's definitely minimalistic for sure. But I, you know, I would guess there's probably three or four mics. If you know, two overheads and a kick. If not, two overheads, a kick, and a and a snare right. mic. You know, on the early stuff. Drew, you got one more. Um, that was from Ba Wells, by the way. What's up, Ba? Um, from Ali Abaz Alavi. Sorry if I said that wrong. Oh, I, I just uh, talked I was, to him. Uh, we oh, okay. Talked to Ali. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Ali, what's up? Yeah, he Ali. says, uh, he asks, uh, some producers now record using amp heads and take the line outs to Pro Tools and then use cab modeling software like Pod Farm or Guitar Rig to emulate the cabs. What's your thought on that approach, Eric? Um, you know, for, for the final guitar tracks, um, I, I'm still the most comfortable just using real amps and real cabs and, and real mics. Um, uh, there, there may be some stuff out there that is getting results that are really working for people. Um, you know, that's been sort of part of my problem with, uh, with computer stuff is I just, I don't have a huge motivation for going there. Like, um, you well, know. you got the real stuff. I, I have a, you know, I've been very fortunate. I have a wonderful collection of stuff that I know really, really well. It's sitting right there. It's like I, I don't want to spend, you know, an hour sifting through plug-in emulator patches when I can just plug in my my amp and and I know the results I'm going to get from mm -hmm. it. Um, so I, I know eventually I'll, I'll probably go there, you know, um, with somebody's help and advice about <laughs> where to start. But uh, yeah. you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, for I now, think, it's, I think what you said is so important. It's 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 better to know one piece of gear extremely well than four or five kind of halfway. I mean, when you know your stuff and you know the predictability of it, and you hear a problem that needs to be solved, and you know in your head you hear the sound from that piece of gear over those years, you just go go and get that. Bring it back. I had a technical question for you. No. Okay. Cool. Yes, please. Look, beyond the fact that I'm still, I'm a little disturbed over that you like large knobs, but we'll, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> still, I'm still sorting through that. Well, so here's yeah. a question. Are you throwing right-handed or left-handed today? Oh, oh, man. Underhanded. All right. So, <laughs> tea, so Will, let's tee up batter's box and let's, let's throw some pitches. There it is. Fire away, Dave. Uh, okay, Eric has uh, Eric has graciously decided that I can break the format a little bit. So I'm going to uh, just I'm going, I'm going to ask Eric. It needs a little bit of setup. I'm I'm going to ask Eric uh, Eric about a sound, and he's going to tell me a record that he's done that he think will be instrumental for our audience to listen to, in terms of a reference. Cool. It's not necessarily his favorite sound, but something that would be good for our audience Love to listen it. to. Love it. Uh, vocals. Um, I'd say. Uh, w one of my favorites is the vocal sound on Walking in the Sun. I mean, I, I just, in general, I just love yeah. Steve Harwell's voice. Yeah. And that particular one was a little different. We used a Coles 4038, and um, I, just had, I, I just feel like it had a really classic sound that sort of suited the vibe of the song and really was flattering for his voice, you know. And okay, acoustic guitar. Um, I think my favorite acoustic guitar is, uh, is on the recent Rejects record. Um, on the, the the title track, when the world comes down, um, I'd recently got a pe pair of um, Shep's 221Bs, and um, and I did a, a stereo miking of the guitar, and it was the, it's the only time I've recorded an acoustic guitar where I didn't EQ it when it was recorded, I didn't EQ it when it was mixed, and there was no EQing on it in the mastering. Wow. <laughs> so it is it is literally that microphone on a guitar directly to the final thing. Drums. Um, drums. Let's see. <laughs> um, 
Boy, that's a tough one. You know, dr uh, drums are a particular passion for me, and there's a, there's a lot of stuff in a lot of different directions that that I, I really really like. Um, you know, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the drum sound on the Queen's record. That, that was an opportunity to do something that was really unique, you know, um, recording the cymbals separately um, and um, being able to keep all the mics a little bit further away to the drum kit. There was, there was really nothing, nothing on that drum kit where there was a mic an inch or two away from a drum. We just didn't do that. Wow. Um, okay. Um, um, by the way, Paul Tingen on, in the SOS did a great article on the Slash on drum techniques. Uh, guitar, rock guitar, distorted guitar. Uh, distorted guitar. Um, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that record has some good guitar sounds. They were tough to get, though. Um, There's a picture on Gear Sluts of your, of your miking technique for that. Moment. Yeah, yeah. I think I would, I would go for um, the, that first um, self-titled Third Eye Blind record. Just uh, Kevin is just, he's such a that's, pleasure to that's work a classic with. classic record. Man, his guitar sounds, and so much of it is him, just his alternate tunings and this peculiar sort of music man guitar, and his whole thing was just amazing, you know. Okay, uh, width, because you, you're, you're known for drums, you're known for width, you're known for a lot of things, but... Um, that one's, that one's a little complicated. Uh, th this has come up. Um, I mean, I think... The quickest answer for that is um, that um, I really feel like uh, a lot of it is inherent in the arrangement itself, being able to place instruments against each other that um, have a contrast that sort of widen out the image. But for me, the sort of like having clarity and detail and width in a mix is all about EQ. And it's what I call voicing, just voicing the instruments so mm -hmm. they own their own place and don't interfere with each other and don't overlap in ways. And that's what the puzzle is about. It's, it's um, making an instrument sound good by itself when it's sort of relegated to a particular part of the frequency spectrum and still sound natural, but still fit into the overall puzzle. You know? That's why we call it mixing. Uh, bass guitar. Bass guitar. Um, I love the uh, bass guitar on uh, the first Smash Mouth record. There's a song called The Fonz that has a really, really great distorted bass sound on it. I'll, I'll go for that cool. one. Cool. I, I gotta go back and listen to that one. Um, what, what song is the most non-traditional, unique sounding song that, you, that someone can listen to? Um, non-traditional. Uh, let's see. There's a really unique song on um, the first uh, Death Ray record called Baby Polygon. People should listen to that record. That's a great record. Um, that one started with elements that they had recorded on a demo version themselves, and then we sort of you know, brought it into the studio and expanded on that. But that one has a bunch of really unique elements, and as far as like width and depth and stuff, it's... Um, Things sort of fell into place on that one. It's, it's a nice one. Auto harp. <laughs> Auto harp? <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Auto harp. Um, Auto harp has had a couple, couple moments. The, the most notable one is on How's It Gonna Be, the, the Third Eye Blind song. Um, it, it had a, a reemergence on the, uh, the Rejects record, the All American Rejects record. Um, that song, The Wind Blows, there's, uh, there's these big sort of auto harp strums on, on the wind <laughs> Just blows. Just messing with you. Well, man, listen, I appreciate you, uh, you sharing all that stuff with us. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back and rewind the tape and go listen to a lot of those myself again. Um, coming, man. Yeah, my pleasure. pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me. a good time. Oh, is this what we say goodbye? Uh, we've got some stuff to do, but yes. Okay. Man, thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate my it. Pleasure. Will you come back in the future? Sure, yeah, of course. It'd be great. I know there's a lot more yeah. information. Uh, quickly, uh, check, check uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that we didn't cover you can find in the SOS uh, last year, right? Um, yeah, there was a Sound on Sound interview, mostly about the Slash record. Yeah, but there's some great yeah, stuff. Mention your website as well, too, so people can go there. Sure, yeah. Um, UndertoneAudio.com. Um, and then the studio's website is uh, BarefootRecording.com. Cool.
cool. Okay. We got it. It's up on the screen as of right now. And uh, we are absolutely going to be pleased to have you back and delve in. Oh, next week's IT Round of applause, Eric. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, before we get out of here and let you get out of here, we got a little bit of work to do. Obviously, we've got our giveaway, Pro Tools 9. And the winner is Solaria, a apparently really cool pop rock band from Hamburg, Germany. There's. You see them up on the screen right now. There they are at Solaria. So congratulations to them. I like that name. Next week's giveaway, enter again. And obviously this week you put in Pro Tools 9 Week 4, not Pro Tools 9 Week 3. I think it's at Promo Jam. Is that Promo Jam, Will? That's where it is. So go there. Put in Pro Tools 9 Week 4. You see that up on our screen. So thanks to Avid for that. Um, did, it, did, uh, did Alex get stumped in the... In the chat room? Not yet. Oh. Not yet. We, we got to close that deal first and then we'll oh, do the focus <laughs> right thing. But they get the focus right Thanks, in, Alex. They get a focus right in a car, don't they, from Vintage King? They get Will's, uh, they get uh, Drew's car. Oh, cool. They, <laughs> they may or may not want that. That's another thing. <laughs> so, again, Eric, thank you. My pleasure. Great. Dave, get thank us home. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, Good thanks. to see you. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. Awkward ending. Take us home, Dave. <laughs> okay, guys. This, I had a lot of fun with Eric. I'm telling you what. I, um, I'm lucky because I get to ask even more questions that, and when the cameras get turned off. But um, once again, let me just reiterate that no matter what type of music you're into, there's a lot you can learn from, from rewinding the tape several times like I'm going to do. And, uh, and then go check them out on Gear Slits. Check them out uh, on uh, Sound on Sound. I've, I've, I've read both those and I learned a lot. So I didn't want to duplicate a, a lot of that stuff. So the interview will be complete when you go check those sources out. Herb. Uh, let's don't have another week like we had this week. Been busy, man. Been busy. It was good, though. It's a good, it's a good busy. Yeah. And busy. by the way, just let's make sure we, before we get to say goodbye, which is in about five seconds, don't worry. We are taking, uh, we are making a list of your requests and guests. And we have lots of plans coming up in the future. So don't think, because you haven't seen it yet, that we're not thinking about some of those areas, be it mastering, live stuff. or all. We've, we've got plans in the works. Stay tuned. We'll be right there to you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right, guys. Um, and, and by the way, Lexus, Mercedes, and a couple of the other girls from Spearmint don't qualify as guests, so you can drop that. Uh, <laughs> was that you, Drew? You caught me. Okay. Anyway, guys, it's been fun. We'll see you next week. <laughs>